I have had psychedelic trips that were very difficult. I fought with a demon for a hundred thousand years. And how was that like? It, horrible. One of the worst experiences of my life. Worse than dead. I had a near-death experience where I took a heroic dose and, you know, everything disappears. There was no world. There's nothing physical anymore. Everything was just pure mental. But there was this mental thing. So consciousness is really central to our existence. I don't know what you are experiencing. And I could be married to you and we could be the most intimate partners and you never really know what they're experiencing because all you see is their behavior. If we all one mind... How can it be? <laughs> how can it be that I don't experience your mind or your mind? So idealism doesn't deny that there is an external world. The external world too, just like us, is made of mental states. Okay, so then once again, how can I test this? How do I know it's true? Well, Analytic idealism, you're throwing out a lot of what we've learned about the universe. Well, I think on the contrary. Or you can believe in the multiverse. We create all kinds of fantasies to stick to our favorite metaphysical prejudices. That's correct. Oh, oh, <laughs> look who's speaking. Look who's talking. Hello, gentlemen. We are here in real life. Podcast is amazing with Introduce Yourself, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Christoph Koch. I'm a, a scientist at the Allen Institute in Seattle, and I'm the head of the uh, Tiny Blue Dot Foundation in Santa Monica, Los Angeles. I'm Bernardo Kastrup, a uh, philosopher, uh, wrote a few books on the problem of consciousness, the mind-body problem, and I'm the head of the Essentia Foundation uh, in the Netherlands. And my favorite guest on the podcast, I'm sorry, Christoph. <laughs> he, 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 we have uh, we had Bernardo so many times. That is amazing. It's the first in real life podcast that we do with him. So and now you're here. Yes, it's amazing. So uh, I'm curious to see what where you think Christoph is the intersection between your work, guys. And how did you meet in the whole concept? I reached out to Bernardo after an extraordinary experience I had on a beach at midnight in Bahia, Brazil. And I felt I had an ontological shock, my worldview, that I, I'm a quite successful scientist, I'm a brain scientist and a physicist, and the worldview I had defended, or I'm still defending for many, many decades, sort of, uh, there was a crack in it. And I wanted to find out more about uh, idealism, which is the philosophy that um, Bernardo espouses, which is a very, uh, it's very rare these days, very uncommon for people to be idealist. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, idealism, because most people today, particular people in the tech industry and scientists that I hang out with, they tend to believe what's called um, machine functionalism or computational functionalism which is really the, the, the belief that you can simulate anything. And once you, you have an accurate enough simulation of something, like the uh, simulation in a, in a VR, you know, of a, in a video game, then, then you can approximate the thing that you're simulating better and better. And then there's ultimately no more difference between the computer simulation and the reality. But this, the, the question is, does this also hold for consciousness? You know, when I have a feeling of being in love or being angry, And many, most people in the tech industry believe, yes, a computer can, of course, be, uh, be conscious. And um, I beg to differ for, for some principal reasons. And idealism is also a, a metaphysical belief that also espouses a very different view on what consciousness is, what the mental is. So you used to be a materialist or you are still a, a materialist? Well, I mean, the materialist, it, 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 it's called a fit. I mean, materialist sort of is an old fashioned term that comes from the 19th century. Because in the meantime, we have things like dark matter. We have things like multiverses. We have Fuse. dark energy that really is very difficult to see uh, materialism. So today it's called physicalism. The belief that, 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 that fundamentally nature is sort of made out of physical things out of quantity, like mass and charge and, and, uh, and gravitational attraction and things like that. Um, but I've always held the belief that consciousness, you know, my experience uh, is independent or is related to, but it's, it's another domain. Right? There are two domains. There's the physical and there's the mental. And how do the, the challenge is always has been, how do they relate? And most people today think, well, the mental is just an outgrowth of physical. It's when certain systems become very complex, then they have an experience. 
but it's really, it's really, there's nothing different about it. Some philosophers, in fact, say when you, when you really talk about the feeling of love or hate or anger or seeing, or seeing red or seeing this crystal, it's all an illusion. It doesn't really exist. I beg to differ. But the question is, what, what is the exact, what is primary? Is it, is it, so you can see that, that philosophy revolves around two poles. Throughout history, at least in the West, there's the, the mental and the physical. And some people, like most people in our country, the US, probably are sort of some sort of dualist. They believe there's physical stuff, but then there's also mental stuff. This comes to us from philosopher René Descartes, right, in the, in the, who was living here very close by yeah, in Holland, yeah, yeah, yeah. although he was a Frenchman, René Descartes. Um, but then how do the two interact? And so over the last 150 years, we've sort of totally pivoted and say, ultimately, everything is physical. Everything is physical subject to natural laws that served us very well. We can build nuclear reactors, nuclear bombs. We can build mRNA vaccines. But we have great difficulty explaining consciousness. That's why some people don't want to deal with it and say, oh, it's all a big illusion. On the other hand, there's this ancient belief that maybe everything is fundamentally mental. Everything ultimately is just sort of stuff similar to stuff consciousness is made out of. And then there are other forms called panpsychism, which just means that everything is in soul, that everything at its fundamental nature already has some, feels like something, has some mental aspect. Even subatomic particles would feel like something, but that's also very difficult to explain. So this is what philosophers have always dealt with. But now scientists are encroaching onto that because we, we study consciousness, we study where it arises in the brain and what happens if you have a disorder of consciousness. So we want to know. And then, of course, we are confronted with these machines like ChatGPT that talk like they're conscious, right? It's remarkable. It's uncanny. And so we're now faced with our question of our age, are they conscious and how would we know? So right now, I just have my ontological system has a crack, but I'm still, you know, card carrying professional neuroscientist that believes that the brain and the mind are very, very, con are very closely related, that consciousness needs this brain, needs this substrate, that if my brain is dead, there's no more consciousness, for me at least. So you are a man search for meaning about consciousness. I'm and that's why you are here uh, to discuss all these things with Bernard, right? That's correct. I, I, yes, I spent the last two days here with Bernardo talking about these things. How was it, Bernardo, talking about all these things the last two days? How what did you talk? What, did you had any breakthrough? What was the conversation? Uh, it, just as Christoph is sort of approaching other metaphysical possibilities uh, over the past. Yeah, months, couple of years, I have been approaching the, the view he has been sponsoring for a while, supporting for a while, him and Giulio Tononi, which is a particular theory of consciousness called integrated information theory, which I initially thought was just a physicalist theory. And from 2017, I started understanding that it was not so. It's a theory that honors the nature of experience. It's based on tenets or axioms that uh, are derived from introspection, the recognition of what experience is. So you need to explain a bit more simple about this theory for okay. me and the audience to yeah. understand. Yeah. So as Christoph <laughs> mentioned, uh, what is popular today is a form of functionalism. What we, and what it says is that um, consciousness is the, the outcome of something the brain does. Like software does something and then out comes consciousness. And if something else would do, would be a simulation of what the brain does, then out comes consciousness as well. And both of us disagree with the functionalism. We think we have to honor the causal powers uh, of, of, of the substrate. So in the case of the brain... So it's a computation. So more, these theories would say consciousness is ultimately a, a clever yeah. hack. If you write the right code and yeah. implement it on the right machine, the machine will be conscious. Yeah. And we both disagree with that. We think it, it is frankly nonsensical. Um, because it's based on the material world, kind of. No, see, if you're a functionalist, Christoph uses a much more polite example where we use my favorite uh, metaphor. If you're a functionalist, um, not only about consciousness, but about everything related to the body, what the body does, you would say that if you have a accurate enough simulation 
of kidney function on your computer and you make it more and more accurate until it's accurate down to the molecular level, then eventually your computer will pee on your desk, which is absurd because a simulation of something is not the thing simulated. A simulation of kidney function is not a kidney. Or your example, a simulation of a black hole is not a black hole. So you can run a simulation on your computer of a black hole, and it's not going to suck you in because a simulation doesn't have the causal powers of a black hole. A simulation of kidney function doesn't have the causal powers of kidneys. By the same token, a simulation of the brain doesn't have the causal powers of the structure of the brain. So it will not output consciousness. But it'll behave as if, as if it's conscious. So chat GPT can talk like it's conscious and will do this better and better, uh, but it doesn't mean it is conscious. So in the limit, computers can do anything we can do, maybe even better and faster, but they will never be what we are, which is conscious. That's a big difference between doing and being. Yeah. So instead of this naive functionalism, uh, what he does, and increasingly I, I buy into, is we first analyze what consciousness is. What is the structure of experience? What are the key properties of experience? What it feels like to experience? So we map that structure. And then we try to find in the world a structure that matches with that. So we can build a map between the two. Where do we find it? Well, we find it in the brain. The structure of brain function, sort of, if, if you look with the right eyes, with the right theoretical uh, um, arsenal, uh, you will find that it mirrors a lot about experience. So if we can construct this map between brain function and experience, we will have an account, at least, of the contents of consciousness. Where we still differ is that uh, Christoph uh, takes the, the substrate, the brain, as a key without it no consciousness. I, I tend to think that uh, the brain is what a certain mode, a certain state of consciousness looks like. And you could have a different form of consciousness that does not correlate with the brain. So you think ChatGPT can have a consciousness? No, but no, no. But I think if your brain is inactive, there can be a form of consciousness at large. That is inactivated. Inactivated. Or inactive. It's a big difference between inactive and inactivated. So that, in the yeah. one case, the brain has lost its causal power because yeah. of an, an external agent like an anesthesia. Then you admit you, that brain can lose consciousness as it does during deep anesthesia, during surgery. And, um, yeah. I, I admit that if you're dead, and your brain is completely inactivated and it has no causal powers, then that is not correlated with individual consciousness. In other words, consciousness that feels it is separate from the world. But I do think that uh, the brain is just what a particular dissociative state of mind looks like. So if the brain is not there, there is still mind, but it's mind at large not mind concentrated in a particular point in space and time. Which you really believe during, let's say you get a, um, a bypass, coronary bypass, right? deep, deep surgical level anesthesia, right? And so you poke the patient, no response whatsoever, and you cut open the chest cavity. You're saying that under this condition, the patient is still conscious? Yes, but not feeling the surgery. Because, you know, an anesthetic will have even another dissociative and your heart rate and blood pressure are monitored. There is no sign that you are experiencing distress or pain, which doesn't mean that you are not experiencing something. But how would I? So, A, if you do good surgery anesthesia properly, there's no memory of it. Correct. Because there is a drug that does precisely that. It avoids memory. People formation. don't move. So how do I know the brain act activity in deep, in deep surgery also goes down? They shift into delta waves, which is more closely associated with sleep. Right? You don't get the normal brain activity that you get um, if you're awake or if you're in a, in a, in a REM sleep in a, when, when you tend to dream. But you see, despite all of that, there's still consciousness there. Yeah. Okay, and, I'll and find that how, how, do I, how, how do you know that, right? Yes, how do I know that? I mean, how do I know my liver isn't conscious but chooses not to tell me because it can't talk? So the way I would reply <laughs> that is, okay, let's go to integrated information theory. Suppose the internet acquires a structure that has hi-fi and the integrated information theory would say it is conscious now. 
because it has enough integrated information. How do you know? Yeah, so once I have a theory, I can then infer, just like once I have uh, the theory of general relativity, I can infer there must be objects like black holes, right? And then people looked for them and found them. So, yes, I grant you, once we have a theory like IT that's well accepted and I look in the liver and I find some structure that, that, that corresponds to what, what IIT, what integrated information theory, IIT is just a short form of it, says it's conscious, then I have to assume it feels a little bit like to be a liver. Now, it doesn't mean that the liver is anxious, that the liver knows about the weekend, Nor am I saying upset that. or in love, but it may feel like something to be a liver. And when the liver is truly dead, it doesn't feel like anything. However, IIT would also predict that under anesthesia, my my consciousness, you know, let's say my egotic consciousness, the one that sort of accesses Broca's area and talks, is gone. IIT has, has no trouble with the idea that conscience can wax and can wane, and maybe during deep certain parts of deep sleep it's gone, and maybe and during anesthesia it's gone. I agree with that. So, so the, the, to tackle this one by one, I, I don't think that there is something it is like to be a liver as opposed to a kidney. The idea is that. Making an inference from theory, just like you said, it's okay. So let, let me do that. Let me make an inference from theory. In this case, a philosophical theory. Under analytic idealism, what is matter? Matter is what mental states look like when observed from across a dissociative boundary. In other words, when observed from the outside. Just like your brain is what your thoughts look like when observed from the outside. When observed from within, your thoughts are what your thoughts feel like to you. But from the outside, they look like a brain. If I do that uh, under idealism for the matter in the brain, the matter in the brain is formed of the same atoms and force fields as the rest of the universe. So I have to extrapolate that. Otherwise, I have a, a, an arbitrary discontinuity. So the inference is matter, all matter, not only the matter in the nervous system, is what mental states look like. Therefore, the liver, too, is what mental states look like, but not necessarily there isn't, there isn't necessarily a correspondence between the liver and one complex. The liver could be an aggregation of ontological dust. Yeah, that, but then effectively it doesn't feel much like anything at all. Yeah, but each component of the liver, there would be for each of them at the level of ontological dust, something it feels like to be them. Yeah, but that's like saying deep space has heat because we know from the background radiation that it's not absolute zero. It's yeah, correct. It's 2.4 degrees Kelvin. For us, it's totally meaningless because for us, for a human, space is utterly unimaginable cold. And to say, well, there's some heat there doesn't really help me. Yeah, I see where you're going. Um, I, I don't know. We are getting pretty deep now. Uh, yeah. Is it okay? Yes, it's very okay. Um, for analytic idealism, because it's a reductionist philosophy, and you know that I have this bias towards reductionism. It, it may be wrong, but it is what it is. That's how I'm put together. For, 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 for us to make the ultimate reduction and explain everything in terms of one thing, that one thing is uh, one subject, like Schopenhauer's um, that which looks out into the world through your eyes and my eyes. Schopenhauer put it that way. So that subject, will. yeah, the will, the will, the will, but n not only the instinctive will. So right? we should say for our audience, Schopenhauer is a German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer of the 19th century, who espoused probably the best known, how would you say, the best articulated idealistic worldview. By far. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that, that would be the single um, ontological primitive of idealism, this, this um, universal subject, which can be, can be visualized as a field. And particular mental states, particular experiences are just excitations of the subject. So from that perspective, even if there is not one complex that is mind at large, but a gazillion, a, a myriad of complexes, underlying each complex, it would still be the same subject, the same eyes of nature that look out from every creature and from everything that is a complex. But then how do you explain? So on this planet, there are 8 billion human-sized complexes, each of which has their own consciousness, assuming everyone is awake and conscious, right? But as you well know, I don't know what you are 
experiencing. And I could be married to you and we could be the most intimate partners, you know, for 30 years. You could be in, interpenetrate, your body can interpenetrate your partner. You can look into his or her eyes and you never really know what they're experiencing because all you see is their behavior. So how do you, if, if we all one mind, how can it be? <laughs> how can it be that I don't, that I don't experience your mind or your mind? You're being kind to me because you know what the answer is and you're trying to give me an opportunity to say it. So, no. so I, 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 I will, I would, I'll take the opportunity. In terms of dissociation, which we don't have a conceptual account for, but IIT, Integrated Information Theory, is by far the most promising way for us to get a clear, unambiguous, explicit conceptual account of dissociation. So what do you mean by dissociation? It's when one mind seems to be many. Uh, which clinically happens to people. And we have known this since the 19th century, but there, ha there has always been that doubt that people lying when they say that there are multiple people like multiple personality disorder, which today is called the dissociative identity disorder, and in which people have multiple seeming personalities with different ages, sometimes different gen genders, different memories, different personality traits. There was doubt about whether this was really true, what people or whether people were faking it until the turn of the century. But with neuroimaging, it's now pre-established that it exists. And however, and some of these patients can have five, six, seven, eight, yeah. nine uh, so-called alters, alternate personality. They might talk with different voices, with different pitch. They have different, one may, be, one may have an immune reaction that the other one doesn't yeah. have. I mean, it's very strange. Can I say something? Sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what is even strange so you and I are different alters of one universal mind and Phidias as well is another oh. and ontological dust is gazillions of others that's the idea at the cost okay so you think there's just one mind so, so remember early on we mentioned sort of philosophy revolves around the two poles of, of physicalism and the mental. So materialism, physicalism says there's only this stuff. And you're saying, au contraire, there's only this stuff. Yeah. So it's a monism. Right? Yeah. And everything I think is real like this and I can hurt myself. So how, how can I hurt myself here? If, if I drop this on your toe, particularly with this point, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be painful. You are a very good podcaster, by the way. <laughs> 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 so how can that be? Yeah, he's giving me another chance. <laughs> um, so idealism doesn't deny that there is an external world, a world outside our individual minds. And that world is what it is, regardless of us. It does what it does, regardless of whether so we like it. World. There is an external world. It's made of states just like we are made of states. The claim is that the external world too, just like us, is made of mental states. Not your mental states, not my mental state. But that mental state is very, very hard and can be very painful. Yeah. Yeah. So if but this hits your head and causes pain, a physicalist would say, well, um, a physical thing has caused a mental effect, my feeling of pain. Therefore, the physical thing precedes the mental effect. So physicality has primacy. An idealist would say, just like the physical brain is what my mental states look like, and that's why experience correlates with patterns of brain activity. Just like that, the mental states of the world outside also have a material appearance. Just like my mental states appear like my material brain, the mental states of the world appear like object, matter. So when this object is hitting my head, what is happening is that mental states outside me are impinging on my mental states, leading to a mental effect. So it's much more elegant. You just remain in the mental. You domain. remain in the mental. You don't need to invent anything other than mental states, which are nature's given. It's how we start. Now, science over the last 200 years and, and civilization has done, well, I wouldn't say well, maybe, but has been enormously powerful and effective because we discovered atoms and, you know, we discovered how to manipulate them and how to build things like computers and vaccines and nuclear bombs, all on the, you call it a fiction maybe, all on the assumption that there are things like atoms and like molecules and like, and other stuff, physical stuff. 
You think that's all just a delusion? No, no. Well, what we colloquially call physical stuff, like this elephant and this pyramid, they obviously exist as experiences, because that's all I, I have. I have. I can see these objects. I can feel their texture, their temperature. These, these are all mental states of mind. I don't deny that there are, there are these things we colloquially call physical. What I deny is that their nature is non-mental. So how can I test this? Okay, it seems like a nice story. Everything is mental. Fine. So how can I? Yeah. So how is this different from just saying, okay, you just call it mental, I call it physical. We do all of our yeah, science. Yeah. And, uh, two questions. Uh, so what what the, difference does it make? Yeah. So the, the, the implication is on how to test it. The implication is. If you're a physicalist, you think your mental states are somehow generated by physical structure. And if that physical structure is not there anymore, if the substrate decomposes when you die, then it, consciousness is gone because it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a glow outside physical arrangements. If the arrangements are not there, consciousness is gone. So when you die, you die. Your consciousness is over. Under idealism, if everything is in fact mental states, then the particular arrangement of mental states that constitute my individual consciousness, that will stop, it will cease to be. But consciousness will continue in some other form. Because now matter is not what generates consciousness, but what a certain state of consciousness looks like. Now that state of consciousness comes to an end, but not consciousness. Consciousness takes another state. So I get this great death benefit. With idealism. Well, you, if you I want don't to... die. I mean, me dies, I die, Christoph dies, but then I go on. What you really oh, are. Not I, but consciousness goes on yeah. in some way. Well, yeah. that sounds pretty attractive. For some people, <laughs> I, I, I've learned that for most people, it is attractive. And for me, it was not. No. Hell yes. I want to live forever like anyone no, else. No, no, you don't. <laughs> I, yeah, I also forever. want to live forever, but I don't want to face this complete unknown. Yeah, that's fine. There are a lot of things unknown. That doesn't bother me in the least. But leaving that aside for the moment, I, so how, how do you test it? Because one thing we've learned over the last two years, so this is my profession. I'm now, because I study the brain, right? And you're telling me, and, and we know for the last 150 years, incredible detail. If you have a stroke, for example, here, I can't talk anymore. If I stroke here, I don't have experiences of faith anymore. If I have stroke here, bilateral, I may not see motion anymore. I see the world like this, or I don't see color. So we know the brain is intimately related to specific aspects. I can put an electrode in my brain and to first order predict what you will experience if you see it here, there, or there. So you're telling this is all, all of that? No, it's all valid. And you know it, but you're giving me a chance to make the case. Uh, no, all of neuroscience. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> all of neuroscience science stays or valid neuroscience stays the same, because the only objective access we have to mental states is through their appearance. Okay, so then once again, how can I test this? If you're saying all of neuroscience is true, all of science is true, but I live after death. Fine, that's okay. a great benefit. So I buy into your into yeah. your metaphysics, but. How do I know it's true? Yeah, so uh, there are two ways to test this. One in physics, one in neuroscience. So let's start with neuroscience. Um, suppose we can measure all states of the brain with infinite resolution in time and space. Because it's an, it's a, it's an in principle argument, right? It doesn't need to be practical. Well, I actually like to test something today. Yeah, that's pretty tough. For the oh, reasons you know. Five years or 10 years from now. Okay, okay. Well, I, I'll give you the direction, but I, okay. I can't give you the timeline. Okay. Uh, but it's the same challenge faced by I IoT, which is how do you measure those states with sufficient resolution? Now, suppose we don't have that problem and we can make those measurements. If there are instances in which people reliably report inner experience that has a certain structure, a certain causal structure, that cannot be reconciled through IIT with the causal structure visible in the brain at the same time, admitting they can timestamp everything with precision, um, then that would be a way to differentiate the predictions of physicalism from the predictions of idealism. Because under physicalism, the brain is the cause of mental states. So there can be nothing to mental states that cannot be found back in the causal structure of brain states. Now, are you referring to near-death experiences or the, the claim no, 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 of near-death? An in-principle argument. 
if you can measure the causal structure of brain states uh, uh, tagged in time with precision, and that does not correspond to the structure yeah. of experience, then under analytic idealism, that's okay, because the image of a phenomenon does not need to say everything there well, is to be said about Well, you could, of course, say, I don't have the right cause-effect structure calculus. I don't have it yet. I need to revise it in order to accommodate that. Now, I'm assuming that you have the right calculus and you have all the measurements you need. Look, let's get a little bit more concrete. It's a little bit too airy yeah, the in, in for me. So, so let's take an, uh, a patient. Yeah, he has um, a, a heart attack. Okay, um, cardiac arrest, uh, you know, two minutes, you wait a minute. Well, I mean, there's all the clinical personnel, but the EG goes what's called flatline isoelectric, right? And then, um, and then ultimately the, the patient is revived. And then, you know, there are all sorts of things injected in his body, sedatives, anesthesia, etc. Finally, the patient wakes up and tells you he had this external uh, ordinary experience, you know, a review of life and he met God or, you know, lots of things happening. And in particular, and, and he tells you that, but what's, what I find most impressive, I believe these accounts, what I find most impressive, th these accounts can often lead to a fundamental change in the attitude to life. Right? They may divorce their spouse, they may, uh, you know, give all their money away, they may become religious, or they may uh, dedicate their lives to an environmental, you know, to a social cause. So the claim there is, so the experience is real, but the claim is that while the brain was flatlined, the entire brain was flatlined, that's in principle. So let's assume, which we don't know for sure, but let's assume actually the entire brain, not just the superficial brain that you can reach with EG, but the entire brain was inactive. That's the claim, right? The brain is inactive. It's, it doesn't produce any, any activity that experimentally we associate with consciousness. It's inactivated because... It, it is inactivated yeah. because of lack of oxygen and yeah. lack of, uh, of, of ischemia and anoxia. Right? Yeah. Uh, so no cause of powers. Yes. The claim is that these people have a conscious experience. That, if that's true, that would totally contradict yeah, everything I've done. Yeah, with all the disclaimers that go, you know, yes. are we so really sure when the experience... Be, yeah, because the other problem is, is the time stamping, right? Yeah. How do I know that this experience that the patient reports, which I assume is veridical, which I assume the patient had this experience, actually happened during that two minutes when the EG was flat, rather than happening on the way to that, or once the brain rebooted. It's a very complicated process. If you think yeah. about it, what happens, you know, when blood comes into the brain again, then some parts of the brain start up, become functioning, turn online, etc. Maybe it happened during that time yeah. and the patient misinterprets it and backdates it uh, erroneously. That would, I, th I think, is probably most likely to happen. But if that didn't happen, if it actually happened while the brain was isoelectric, then yes, neuroscience is in trouble. I don't think the whole of neuroscience is in trouble because most of the times experience does correlate with the brain. Space. Well, except this major exception. I mean, you can't get away in science with saying, well, there's only a little, uh, there's only a little exception. It's like energy conservation. Either energy is conserved or it's not conserved. If it's not conserved by 0.1%, you're in trouble. Your theory is in trouble. So if you tell me that the brain, that the brain can be sort of inactivated during, during this cardiac arrest, yet the patient still have, where is his experience? What's the substrate for his experience? And then all these claims, you know, these, to me, outlandish claims that the patient has access to the thoughts of his loved ones and knew what the doctor at the bedside was actually thinking. You know, I find this all very, very strange. <laughs> and it certainly, certainly goes flat out against, against uh, physicalism. So it's a little bit troubling if we accept it. Let, let, let's, for the sake of argument, let, let's say we accept it. Let's say the experience happens when the brain is indeed isoelectric. There, there are no causal powers. Under analytic idealism, the brain with its normal functioning, the biological body, is what a dissociative process in the mind of nature looks like. So when the brain is isoelectric, that means that uh, there is no dissociative boundary being enforced anymore. Because what the dissociative, dissociative boundary being enforced looks like is normal brain function. If it's not there, then the dissociative process is being impaired in some way. What would you expect if analytic idealism is right? You would expect an expansion of consciousness. You would expect what um, in psychiatry people call the index of self-transcendence. 
you can fill out a form, a form and you get the, you know, your index of self-transcendence, you would expect that uh, if people would fill out that form during the NDE, it would score super high. You would identify with the world. So with why everything. do I have a brain? If I can directly access without a brain, if I yeah. can directly access your thought, why do I need a brain? Why do I need to talk if I can directly know what you're yeah, thinking? I agree that there is trouble there when people claim that they have seen things, they have heard things during an NDE. Because why do we need eyes and ears? But directing, directly accessing somebody else's thoughts, uh, I think it stands to reason that it would, be, it would be easier because now there is only one dissociative boundary between the two. But then why one. do I need language? I don't need language. I, why? If, if, I, know, if yeah. I know what you're thinking, why do yeah. I need to talk? So how did this happen? So it's evolution. Let's imagine that once upon a time, a dissociative process formed spontaneously in nature because everything that can happen in nature given enough time will eventually happen. So this dissociative process is a it's living so, organism. It's so key. To, to your ideas is some sort of um, a boundary yeah. that that limits my brain. Uh, no, that limits, limits your my mind, mind from to the rest of nature. Only limited to my brain somehow. Limited to what you call your personal mentation, your individual mind, your yeah. everything that you experience and not what you don't experience. So how does this boundary between the mind in here and the mind there came to be? A dissociation would eventually form spontaneously because it can form, so it would eventually form. Right? Well, you mean like life? Life. What would that first like dissociation... Like a membrane, the first cell. Exactly. Abiogenesis. Abiogenesis, under analytic idealism, would be what the first dissociated alter would have looked like. Once that forms and can reproduce, now so evolution So life is a dissociative in. process? Yes, that's the idea. And why did mm. life and why does life enforce the dissociation? Because that's what life is. So what the early organisms that survived were the ones that were good at enforcing the dissociation. Then all the rationale of evolution by, by natural selection kicks in. Now, now it's dissociated, but you still need information about the external world. How do you go about it? Well, sense organs. That's how representations arrive, ar arise. That's the physical world. You represent then, external states. Okay, I get that. But then evolution also would have shown, because of ra random happenings, that without a brain, I can actually do much better. Because without a brain, I can no. directly know what you're thinking. No, no, because an outer without a brain would not do any better. Oh, wait, you, you just told me in an NDE, in a near-death experience, people can access other people's... Uh, when you are in an NDE, you are not playing in the ecosystem. The, the, the forces of selection are not applying to you. Now you are the whole universe. You are no longer an altar. You are, you are no longer a living being. You are not playing in an ecosystem anymore. That is irrelevant for evolution. Wait, but my body is still in this universe. And... It's completely inactive. It's irrelevant. It's dead for all intents and purposes. It, well, it's dead, yet it has access to the universal mind. No, but that's the thing. The universal mind is not limited to that dead body. The dead body is a footprint of something that nature was doing and it's no longer doing. An eco stays behind, a footprint. Hmm. And why, if there's a universal mind, why do these people report typically minds of people that are very close by, the doctor or their parent or partner or kid or whatever? No processing nature ends instantaneously at the drop of a dime. It's always a process. Combustion doesn't burn everything there is to burn, boom, instantaneously. No, there is a process of burning. Ashes are left behind. The end of the dissociation is not instantaneous. Your body doesn't flash out of existence. It's no longer active, so there is a very fast change. Your metabolism ends, but it, it's still there. And then we know that cells encapsulate, sort of go into hibernation in the first hours after death. They don't, they don't die immediately. So there is a process. What would you expect as the dissociation ends and the dissociative boundary becomes permeable, weaker, there can be commerce across the boundary? Well, you would expect that mental states inside would react with mental states outside in a way that is evocative. In other words, the people you love, that's the first reaction. That's how the links of association would happen. First, where you are, the people you love, what you, what you care about. So space and time is still relevant here. Space and time is the appearance of cognitive proximity. 
It's what cognitive proximity looks like on the screen of perception. My daughter is a thousand miles away from here. But I've... you're still cognitively close to her. Yes, but I don't access Yeah, her but states. if you have an NDE, I people could, who have NDE, they That's report. your claim. If I had an NDE, I would have access to her state. I don't know that, but that's what people report. Now, the, the exercise was we take those reports in case <laughs> value for the sake of argument. That's what people report. You can be on the other side of the world. If your son is across the ocean and you're dying, that's how you react first. You react with your cogn what's cognitively close to you. Emotions are the reactivity of mental states. All right, I, I hear you. It's a tall order to accept yeah. that this would uh, exist because it contradicts everything I know about space-time. It would contradict uh, relativity because now we're talking about information that's transmitted potentially with superluminal mm. velocity. Uh, I know some of these accounts say I can know what happens in the future, in the past, that no, contradicts be, be, causality. So they are... But let's throw it all out. Let's throw it all out. No, 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 no. None of this you need to throw out. What you're talking about are the rules of the game of the colloquially physical world. In other words, the world as it is seen through perception and represented by us through perception. Perception has some built-in patterns and regularities, which we call the laws of nature. Those hold. The problem is, if you're no longer an alter and you're no longer limited by dissociation, you're playing under different rules. Because you know, okay, but under those rules, all these all these things that we know, things like general relativity, the speed of light, disappear. No, they represent things that are true about how the world as it is in itself behaves. But they are representations of those regularities. They are not the thing in itself. Yes, so therefore I should be able to access anyone else's mind instantaneous. Well... According to Einstein <laughs> uh, and the idea of the block universe, the, the ontological status of the past, the present, and the future is identical. All exist. The past does, is not something that ceases to exist, and the future doesn't, doesn't need to arrive. It's there already right now. Now, I'm not necessarily defending the block universe because I think there is a better argument, which is space and time don't really exist, and that's where we are going with uh, loop quantum gravity. If we want to reconcile quant uh, quantum field theory with general relativity, we will probably need to part with the notion that space-time is objectively real up there. We don't they know that. That's one idea of many, Correct. many, many that physicists are playing around Correct. with. Correct. But it would... Um, your argument that if you know what's happening in the mind of your son across the, uh, across the ocean would defy uh, relativity, it wouldn't really. Because of the block universe, because space and time may well, not... Well, but they're still, even within the block universe, things can oh, only be influenced within the light yeah, cone. The light so I'm cone. assuming okay. my son has taken a futuristic uh, starship and is now, you know, Elon no, 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 starship no, no, no. is now an Alpha Proxima Centauri no. 3.4 light years no. away. We can go back to Kant for the answer. Kant and Schopenhauer. But space they didn't time. know about general relativity. I'm sorry. And But, but then, look, quantum gravity then. Which is the notion that... Uh, uh, we don't know whether that's true. We do know general relativity is by far the best description of, of the universe at large scale works, time. It with, works incredibly Within its well. constraints. Just like Newtonian mechanics works within its constraints. It doesn't mean that it's the Bernardo, ultimate... Bernardo, but you're throwing out with your analytic idealism, you're throwing out a lot of what we've learned about the, about the, the universe. I think on the contrary. For instance, um, the... the, the Physi physics experiments that won the Nobel Prize in 2022, entanglement, that um, physical properties seem to appear only, only upon measurement. Before you measure them, they are not there because the choice of measurement determines what they are. The experiment has been showing this for over 40 years. Under physicalism, this is impossible because physical entities should have standalone existence. They should exist for themselves. And therefore, when you measure, you just disclose the properties they already had before you measured. Under analytic idealism, in which the physical world, all physical entities, are representations on a dashboard of the real states of the world, of course physical properties only arise when you measure, because they are the outcome of measurement. But the thing that is measured is not physical, and now you can reconcile a, a lot of physics that today we, we consider discombobulating. But yes, 
I do, if, if I am to take NDE seriously, not analytic idealism, analytic idealism does not depend on these non-local experiences of NDE. Analytic idealism survives fine if we dismiss all that, and if we deny all that. But the experiences of an NDE, if we take them on face value, then they would defy locality. Yeah, one could say, well, locality has been dead in physics for 40 years, but okay, in general relativity, not. So we would deny that by taking the experiences on face value. Could we still reconcile that with science? You bet. That's precisely the direction physics is going now, which is to deny the objective existence of space-time and think of the world as an abstract structure, which I would say, well, it's not abstract, it's mental, but it's just a structure. Yeah, but what bothers you? I've no trouble with, yes, I realize in physics things are challenging for classical physicalism and, and physics has still yet not fully coped with the implication of that. There are lots of, as you know, there are lots of different attempts to try to reconcile these quantum mechanical fun, you know, the Schrodinger's cat dead and the light yeah, and all yeah. of that. But we haven't arrived at yet. But what I find very troubling is um, the idea that the that if we just talk about mind, I mean, troubling, it just contradicts all my living experience because, you know, in the clinic, you can see there's this very lawful relationship between mental states and let's say you can, EG, you know, when, you know, you can tell whether the patient is asleep in which state of sleep he is, you can sort of predict whether they're dreaming or not. And, and, and all of that, you're saying, well, that's all fine. That, that's all true. But there's all this other thing. Once the brain truly shuts down, then, we have all these other wonderful conscious experiences of mind at large, which is wonderful. And I mean, I wish it were true, but I find it very difficult to uh, to accept. I guess the, the, the challenge is for me to look at these near-death experiences and are they, how likely are they going to be true? How likely is it really true that we have solid evidence to suggest that while the brain is truly offline, people have had that experiences. And right now, because it's difficult to obtain this evidence, this is always you can't rig a experiment yeah. ahead of time. Yeah, you it's can't very, kill very, people <laughs> to it's, make a, um, a test. Yeah, um, um, it's very difficult to test. So, are there other implications that are a little bit more easily accessible? Oh, the, the one in quantum in foundations of physics that I just discussed. That's true, but that's more difficult to relate to the brain and to consciousness. If we just stick true. with consciousness. Uh, uh, for a moment, then even because you could also just take the classical physics approach and say, "Shut up, Bernardo, and calculate." Yeah, calculate. Yeah, because so if you do that, things work out fine. You don't yeah. worry. Or you can believe in the multiverse. You can believe every time there's a superposition happening. Yeah. Well, there's two universes. We that create split all off. kinds of fantasies to stick to our favorite metaphysical prejudices. That's correct. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Look who's speaking. Look who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for consciousness. Um, and mind and brain. Yeah. You probably don't need to go as far as an isoelectric brain, brain with no causal powers to, to test the hypothesis. Because the hypothesis is that um, brain processes, neuro neuronal processes, are what mental processes look like. Mental processes of a dissociative nature. And that's why we, are, we don't feel that we are the world. Now, if that is the case, then the dissociative boundary itself, the process that enforces the dissociation, that too should be in that image. In other words, there should be some forms of brain activity that correspond not to, your, to the content of your mental states, uh, but to the dissociative boundary itself, the enforcer of the dissociation. Any That's, hypothesis? <clears throat> any hypothesis for what that might be? The literature is uh, not necessarily consistent in that regard, but um, in, in 2010, there was a paper in Neuro um, written by Italians. Um, they did a, a, a prospective study of uh, patients who had brain tumors, malignant or not, but they needed to be removed. The brain tumors need to be removed. And of course, there is always some you know, peripheral, some collateral damage in tissues uh, in tissue around the, the tumors and they scored the patients for self-transcendence before and after surgery and controls as well. And it turned out that there are two very well-defined areas in the heart region. Um, if you- The posterior heart zone. Yeah, um, if I remember correctly. 
uh, on both sides, and not the different side on both sides, but uh, one in one side of the brain and the other in the other side of the brain. And if you have collateral damage to those areas, um, self-transcendence grows quite significantly, not only statistically significant, but very <laughs> significantly. But uh, that comes at a cost to a loss of some function, suppose. Perhaps, perhaps. Well, because otherwise, why would nature have evolved? To, to take that out. I mean, yeah, there's this, uh, this claim that we only use 10% of our brain. There's no evidence No, no, that's, that, not, so. that's not what I mean. No, from an evolutionary perspective, the more self-transcendence you experience, the less you will care about surviving. In other words, you, you will, it will not be favored by natural selection. What is favored by natural selection is that you think you are just this body and you, did, you would defend it tooth and claw until the so end. So you're saying these areas actively inhibit self-transcendence. It, it, it's a hint. It, it, it's a hint. It says, are these areas involved in representation of the self? Do you, do you happen to know what these areas are? Yeah, They're like posterior uh, no, media. I, I have to look it up. It's a paper from 2010. I don't remember anymore. Well, because we know there are these areas in the in the back, as you said, the, in the, within the posterior hot zone, the posterior cingulate, the posterior medial, the precuneus, they're on the sort of, you know, the brain is like two halves of, a, of a, a walnut and they're on the inside sides, the medial sides of the back on both sides. And they are involved in representing self, bodily self. So if people have seizures there or if you stimulate there, you get weird association of self. You might float. You might no, the it's not that. And, and wait, but, but because we do know on up psychedelics and, and on a certain forms of meditation, you have a reduced... Uh, activity in there, which corresponds to the way you experience meditation or self, right? You get the self loss up to ego dissolution. And interestingly enough, you have a reduction of activity in there. So that's compatible yeah. with those, those areas. I don't know. I have, I have to look it up again, but there are many studies. And the point I was trying to make is that they don't all point up, point to the same areas. There was a study done with the Vietnam war veterans who had suffered brain damage because of war uh, wounds. And there, there were a couple of regions where those wounds correlated with a much higher propensity to a religious or mystical experience. So that, that's a, another data point. But the general prediction of analytic idealism would be the following. Some impairments or reductions of brain activity, not all of them, because most of our brain activity has to do with our cognitive faculties. Only some of it would be related to the, the dissociative process itself. But at least some impairments or reductions of certain types of brain activity, I don't know which ones, some should correlate to a higher index of self-transcendence or what people call expanded consciousness, richer mental states, or the idea that you are not only this, you are everything that's going, around, going on around you, or that you connect with other people directly, like um, one of these end years, Anita Morjani, she said, I met my father, But it was not like I met my father. It was more like I was my father, her dead father. So this is the kind of thing one would expect. And lo and behold, I, 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 the details are still to be debated, but there are a lot of procedures that impair or reduce uh, brain activity that do correlate with reported expansion of consciousness. Psychedelics, which reduce brain activity in the default mode network. Um, uh, injury, be it through surgery or you no. Know, I mean, trauma. most brain, brain injury is bad for you. Let's not most. mince words. People go to the clinic because they're unable to move the left side or they can't speak anymore or they get aphasia or all sorts of agnosia. Right? They don't see yeah. things anymore. So, But some brain injuries should correlate with expanded consciousness. And that, is, that has been seen. And even acquired savant syndrome, it, it seems to correlate even with better cognitive skills, like much clearer memory, the ability to perform mathematical computations at the drop of a dime. That can happen after bullet wounds, uh, lightning strikes to the head, trauma, even the progression of dementia. I mean, I can see why self-transcendence is, um, while a very beneficial state, it's not evolutionary advantageous if I just no. sit there and so oh love is all yeah I'm until the, the tiger comes I'm and be eaten, right <laughs> so clearly that may be good for my mind but it's not good for surviving exactly. so that I can I can uh, I can appreciate so you think the dissociative border could be uh, could be an inhibitory process that somehow prevents it's a so it's a physical thing it's a neuronal 
thing. It has a physical image. Or it has a physical image, a physical manifestation that prevents, I see. So my dream would be... So in principle, you should be able to build, uh, you know, Elon Musk-like, Neuralink... Uh, like you don't structure. That. You don't need that. Uh, 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 Why well, you can uh, take magic mushrooms? Magnetic stimulation. TMS. TMS does all sorts of things, including, of course, you know, you can get uh, relief of depressive symptoms. Yeah, but you can it, get... it can inhibit neuronal firing. If you know where to do it with the right protocol, maybe RTMS, repeated, repeated TMS. Yeah, so people are in fact are doing that over different parts of the brain now. In fact, you can go in the US, you can go to a mall outside LA and you can get your brain RTMS uh, <laughs> if you feel you're under the weather. Uh, Do you know what it is, TMS? Trans I assume it's like a dras? No, so no. It's, a, it's a magnetic coil. TMS stands for trans, trans, transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. You put a coil here and you send a brief electrical current through and it activates neural mechanisms and, and neurons underneath the skull. So it's non-invasive. I don't need to cut you open. And it's used now in, in, in the world, but particularly also in the US, to address things like um, treatment-resistant depression, Uh, it was approved by the FDA for OCD, for uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. And people are doing it experimentally to inhibit or excite different parts of the brain. This, uh, this technique. It's a, it, And we don't know why it works. No we, no, we have some pretty good understanding. It's a magnetic, it's, an, it's Maxwell current laws. Yeah. It's you change rapidly magnetic field, which induces an underlying current in the underlying neuron. So it, you know, the physics of it and there are companies that make these calls, there's nothing magical about it. Yeah. This is a physical thing. At least it has a physical image yeah, in your yeah, language yeah, yeah. and it works, <laughs> it works pretty reliable. But, but the hypothesis I'm bringing forward is that if you, if you know exactly where to do the TMS, which area of your brain with the right protocol, like you have, may have to do it repeatedly with a certain frequency in a certain amplitude. So if you find the right protocol, the hypothesis is that a mystical experience could be induced in you without you having to take a drug or die to have an NDE just with an electromagnetic field applied in the right way to the right side. Because the hypothesis is that you could then disrupt, disrupt the, the process that enforces the dissociation. So your mind would expand, you know, you, you would so have a trip. People are trying to do this experimentally now. It's not that far-fetched because we know you can do something else. You can take a drug like, like magic mushrooms or like, you know, ayahuasca or something else. And you can act, you can be in, in a mystic state. You did or not yet? Yes. Yes. You may want to talk to him about that. <laughs> um, um, so we know there are ways of accessing those states. So it's not that outrageous that something more physical, more associated with technology, like a, a TMS device. So it's a, it's a figure eight coil that you put here and you... Yeah. As you know, I'm a technologist. I'm very much for technology. Um, I'm, right. I, I, I'm very passionate about what I'm going to say to you now. I, it's like all the other stuff you were not passionate. <laughs> Finally, we've got to fire it up. <laughs> now I'm really, really passionate. Uh, I think you really should try to avoid the thought that a new metaphysical understanding would invalidate any of science. It may invalidate some assumptions you made about how those scientific observations come to be, but the observations reflect true regularities in nature. They don't suddenly become invalid because we interpret the world differently. Wait, so, so are you saying there's not a single assumption of physicalism uh, as it applies to things like brains, again, if we just stick with consciousness and brains and minds that would be invalidated during every day, you know, egoic consciousness of the thought that we all possess and we can ask other people about. Not the assumptions that actually work <clears throat> in practice. They may be a convenient fiction. In other words, those assumptions may not ultimately be true, but in those circumstances, they worked. And the fact that you now see things with a different light and you know those assumptions were not quite true, like uh, Newt Newtonian mechanics is not quite true, but it still worked. It, it didn't become invalidated because you, you concluded that it's not a force of gra gravity, it's the bending and twisting of the fabric of space-time. You have a new convenient fiction, you have a new narrative for it. But science is about predicting what nature will do next. 
if it's predicting right, it, con it will continue to predict right, even if you understand nature in a different way. So I, 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 I really feel passionate that we should not think that replacing physicalism with idealism is a kind of throwing away of our hard-earned progress in science because it i i really all right so then what do i so i get the death benefit that i'm not dying i mean i'm dying yeah. but yeah. i'll still be i'll become part of something much larger which sounds pretty cool to me so are there any drawbacks are there any metaphysical or otherwise drawbacks to being in uh an analytic idealist? To me, there is. <laughs> and maybe that's the most uh, ironic part. Look, when I was at CERN, I was 23, 24 years old. I was at CERN. I was an unthinking physicalist. Um, and my father died when I was 12. So I have a relationship with death from very early. I thought, I felt death is not to worry about at all because I'm not going to be there. I'm there. There will be no consciousness there to feel pain, to feel anxious, to feel lost, disorientated. So I don't suffer from the greatest fear mankind has had throughout its entire history, which is the fear of what you experience after you die. I didn't have that issue. Now I do. And I have had psychedelic trips that were very difficult. I have had one, um, I don't do them anymore. It was part of my own research program years ago. I thought I couldn't write about consciousness, living in the Netherlands, having legal access to it and not doing it, right? I need to know what that's about. So I did it. And I have had a couple of psychedelic trips in which I fought with a demon for a hundred thousand years. And when I come back, when I came back, uh, I was flattened. My grandson would be so jealous of you. Because he keeps on going around, I kid you not, I want to be a demon. I want to be a demon. I, <laughs> I fought with demon. one. I wasn't one. <laughs> I fought with one for 100,000 years. And how was that like? It, horrible. One of the worst experiences of my life. It was worse than worse than that. Wait, do it, you expect the, 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 uh, great, no. the mine at large to be filled no, by demons? No, I don't know. And that's the problem. Because a psychedelic trip is the best death analog we have today. It, it, it wreaks havoc with your default mode network. It destroys your sense of self. It makes you feel that you are dying. If, but if that's by, not your typical and near-death experience. The typical near-death experience is more the bright light and you lose sense of self. There's no more bodies, no more Bernardos. Can no you more sign on a piece memory. of paper, notarize that you guarantee no. to me that... Uh, there you go. Uh, but so, you know... <laughs> For me, that's not, that has I nothing see. again for idealism. The gain is that meaninglessness has been erased from my life. Oh, you get meaning? The, yeah. Wow. How do you get meaning? Because what, what, meaninglessness to me was the following. I suffer for decades to mature, to learn a thing or two, to develop an insight or two about nature, the universe and everything. And then I die and it's all lost. It was all for bloody nothing. That was my meaninglessness. Now it's different because now I'm a dissociated, a dissociated process in the mind of nature. My death is the end of the dissociation. All my insights, all my hard-earned maturity is now available to the whole of nature. Oh, that's, that's very nice. So you don't believe, you don't imagine Sisyphus happy? No, Sisyphus has disappeared from my life. You know, you know no, the I'm myth not. of Sisyphus. Sisyphus uh, is condemned to push a big boulder up a hill. Oh, yeah. And when he gets up there, he, the bow rolls down. And he knows it fully and well. And he knows it. And then he has to go back down and roll it up again. He's and that for Zeus. eternity. And, and you have to imagine Sisyphus happy. It's a very order. famous essay by a French existentialist philosopher. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for you to have meaning, you have to imagine Sisyphus happy, <laughs> which is impossible for because me. Because he realizes he's master of his own fate. I was deeply moved by when I first read that as an 18-year-old. No, I, I, I can't. Any other that. drawbacks of analytic idealism? Other than if the return of the greatest fear humankind has Oh, no, 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 no. Ever that that <laughs> seems to be your fear. That's certainly not my oh, fear. On, Christoph. It's, it's certainly not my fear. And many other people I know are more fearful of death as, as the, the cessation of anything. It's because you take it for granted. Something. You take for granted that you're not going 
to, to have a bad experience. The Catholic oh, Church no. has had complete control over the European population for a thousand years based on this one fear. A thousand years of Look, control. Okay, but you have to accept this psychological fact that I'm certainly not afraid of it. And there are lots of other people who I know have talked about also not afraid. You know, there's some universal mind at large and we'll see what it is. You no. had an ecstatic experience and that is coloring your expectations. Maybe, maybe, maybe. You didn't fight a demon for a hundred thousand years. I did years. not fight. I, I didn't see any demon. A demon yeah. that wanted to consume my soul, uh, everything that is to be me. Uh, I've been in a black hole during a trip, which is not so pleasant when your entire body gets stretched <laughs> infinitely long <laughs> and, you know, space time. It's, that's not so pleasant. But, you know, yeah. I, so when you had a uh, psychedelic experience, other uh, accept these uh, other exciting moments, accept this fight with the devil. There, there were wonderful moments. Yeah. Yeah. A, a psychedelic experience. So it could be good. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, look, I, I don't think it is entertainment. I, I never came to it for entertainment. Uh, even good t trips can be very hard, can be very taxing cognitively sometimes physically. So I did have my doctor check my liver function and, and my heart um, because you may have an experience that um, increases your blood pressure and your heart rate quite a bit, like, like running upstairs, you know, several flights of stairs. Um, and your liver needs to be in good condition to metabolize um, the psychedelic so you come back down, <laughs> otherwise you're tripping uh, for a long time. Um, so I don't, I don't see it as entertainment at all. For me, it was part of a sort of a research program on consciousness. Is it bad to see it as entertainment? It's not as well. It's like well I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not going to judge people who use it for entertainment. It, it, it just wasn't my, it wasn't my trick. But for you, intellectual knowledge is also entertainment. So it's also a form of entertainment. It's more revelatory, I would yeah. say. It's revelatory than it is certainly not uh, entertainment. It's not like drinking a, a glass of wine, at least. Yeah. For me also, you know, a glass of wine, you relax with friends, that's, that's relaxing, but this is, um, it reveals something about the universe. Yeah. And if you want it to mean something to you, there is the whole process of integrating that. You know, how, how do you account for it? What, what do you do with it afterwards? How does it change your life? How does it change your thinking? And all of that can, can be demanding, cognitively, quite demanding. I did have very meaningful trips. I did have wonderful trips. Um, but you are talking about more than 20, 30 times the trips? About 20 or 30 times in a period of three years. Yeah. And, um, and then you were like bored of it? I stopped doing it, not because I was bored, but it started becoming very difficult to return from a psychedelic trip, what I used to call re-entry because you get um, sometimes, not always, but often you get, at least I did, you get to a state in, in which there are no bounds. You're not limited in space or time. It's like your mind is flowing three, free in, in, in a space that, um, that you can access instantly depending on how you set your mind or what you set yourself to do, you, you're immediately there, and you seem to be, you feel boundless. You um, met God, yeah, to, and then you still have to take out the laundry the next yeah, day. Yeah, and then you have to fit into a body and drive to work the next day. That was your experience. No, well? no, but that's yeah, he, I think he, what he he's trying to say. And he knows right? he's you've become the out. universe. You've met God, and now oh, now <laughs> yeah. back here and I still have to deal with the garbage. And I, yeah. I, I see you a bit hesitant to talk about your experience. Is it because of some legal stuff? Is it because you are? Do you, do you talk about it publicly? I mean, I <clears throat> yeah, I'm just. I've had you know a, n a number of experiences with different substances. And uh, only late in life, although I've studied consciousness for 40 years, I've only come to, to these substances late in life. And they were uh, very powerful experiences. And one uh, where it was a, uh, I had a near-death experience where I took a heroic dose and, you know, everything disappears. And it taught me a lot 
you know, myself disappeared, my body disappeared, space disappeared, time disappeared, the perception of the flow of time disappeared. There was just a visual, there was bright light and terror and ecstasy. What it taught me, A, that once again, the primacy of consciousness, there was no world, there's nothing physical anymore. Everything was just pure mental. But there was this mental thing. So consciousness is really central to our existence. And then also it totally, to, I, so I did have, I, I guess, almost opposite from complimentary to you. I did have a fear of death because I don't like the thought of, of me being dead forever and ever and ever. <laughs> And I've lost, totally lost that fear since, since I had this experience in the first month of the pandemic. So, so it's a, it's a powerful but positive experience. <clears throat> and then I had this other experience, the reason why, why we're here. Um, this was as part of a long, uh, ayahuasca ceremony. You know, it's like 12 hours and you fast and you chant, you dance. It's part of Santa Daimo, um, <clears throat> religious tradition and where, where you, come to the state where you access what your experiences are as a mind at large, where you feel you're, you're literally, you are the universe. You are everything and everything is you. There's no more distinction between you and the universe. And it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a thing of, of incredible beauty and transcendence. And then, you know, I try to understand now what does it tell me? Like, what does it reveal? What does it tell me? And how can I fit this into my view of the physical and the mental? Because, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have a, you know, a, a singular understanding of everything in the universe. And so that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe physical is, maybe consciousness is really the only thing ultimately there is, which is a closer position to idealism than I used to be. So you are moving slightly yes, to that okay. direction uh, because yes. of your metaphysical experience with this stuff or because of your intellectual thinking? Well, no, primarily it's the experience. Interesting. I mean, the experience. The experience is, you know, it's, real, it's more real. I mean, you feel, right, that you've come, finally, this is it. This is real reality. This is, you know... I call it hyper-realization. You come, this is what really, it, what really yeah. is the case. Everything else is sort of a, 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 a representation. Uh, you know, it's a distant mirror. It's a distant image of the real thing. But now I see the real thing. Yeah. Uh, and then you try to use your intellect and my science, etc., to see, well, how can I fit this in? And uh, I mean, one explanation would be uh, would be a form of of um, analytic um, idealism. So you asked so many questions, Bernardo. Today you challenged him in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm curious to hear kind of your full thoughts about where do you come to believe? Where where do you stand right now? Well, right now, given. I find it very difficult. I I really like what you say that you don't have to. <clears throat> an uh, idealism does not force you to say, well, what you learn about science and day to day and that works in the lab and works in the clinic. All of that's nonsense. No, all of that's still true. Yeah, it's not at all invalidated. So that's great because that we know every day. This is what this is what makes science so powerful. Yeah, things just. If you do the right experiment, things work. That's why we can land on the moon and build nuclear reactor or build, you know, M uh, mRNA vaccines. It just works when you've got the right mechanism. You don't want to throw that out, but maybe you can you can expand your yeah. understanding of what really is, uh, and maybe it's true that all of this uh, is a is a is an image of something ultimately that is a mind. So you know, it's 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 not an instant, unlike a psychedelic experience that can be compressed in an hour or two where you there's a clear before and there's a clear after you know here it's an ongoing process of intellectual evolution is it challenging yeah of course of course i mean to believe in the existence of things like like some of the things we talked about that people can have can have an experience can experience something while their brain is flatlined yes that's very difficult to accept because you've been, you worked all your life in, in an environment where the dogma is 
brain death is, in fact, this is a, you know one of the definition of death in the United States, Uniform Determination of Death Act, irreversible loss of all brain function. That's considered brain dead. Okay, you you might still be breathing because you're on a you're on a ventilator. Your heart might still be be uh, be beating. Your skin pallor is normal, but if your brain is irreversibly lost all function, you're considered brain dead. But now you're telling me, well, maybe, maybe what? Maybe this? No, you're dead. But you have never been the thing that is dead now. You just thought you were. Well, the ego that used to be, that, that used to inhabit that body is dead. Gone. Okay. But it, it, you're not going to mourn the death of your ego for the same reason that when you wake up in the morning, you don't mourn the death of your dream avatar. Although you also admit, in fact, you're scared. Maybe now you have to fight demons yes. for a thousand years. Yes, okay. I am scared. Because now, no, I know the dream. I, I know that I'm not the dream avatar, but I know the dream territory. When I wake up, I don't know what the territory is going to be. And yeah, that, I, I'm, I'm bloody scared of that. Maybe I should, I, I'm less scared now than I used to be. I don't know, maybe I'm getting older. And, and I, for some reason, it's like, well, it's going to be what it's going to be which I couldn't do. Well, it could also be of a form that we don't recognize because if there is sort of a world soul, you know, uh, anima mundi, it may be something very simple. It may just be one simple, undifferentiated state, like a basic hum. Yeah. You know, when you, when, when you do mushrooms, you can sometimes hear, I think it's you're actually hearing your, 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 your pulse in your ears. You hear that. Have you ever heard this? The, yeah, I know the beating the heart of the universe. You can yeah. hear it. I have tinnitus, so I can't hear it. But my tinnitus just gets worse. But I, I have heard this. Okay, so maybe the universal anima mundi, the universal soul, is just this basic beating of that the universe. That would be very comforting. Nothing else. That would be very comforting. So there's no love. There's no memory. There's no wanting. There's just this relatively I, simple, undifferent. It, it's a feeling. It's a conscious state. But it's a very simple, undifferentiated I, I, I don't come at this with a romantic perspective, like, oh, it's going to be so loving and let's hold hands together and sing the Kumbaya. I'm, I'm a naturalist. And the price for being a naturalist is that even if we are talking about the survival of consciousness after death, I don't bring the romanticism into it. I know things can get pretty ugly in nature here. I have no reason to think that it can't get ugly in that other state, if you know what I mean. One of the greatest pieces of uh, West in the Western canon of classical music is the opera by Richard Wagner, Tristan Isolde. And that's all about mystical experience. In the you second know, act, yeah. uh, they sing Then I Am Myself the World, which is also the title, the title you know, of your book, <laughs> of my next book. But so there are the, these two lovers that are sort of, con they can't live in the real world for various reasons or you know that are explained in the opera so they they want to die but they want to sort of transcend themselves and their own identity to become one and one with the universe that seems to suggest it's a very ecstatic state and that's also what what you can certainly experience uh, under uh, ayahuasca these very ecstatic states maybe mixed in with with uh, with um, and with terror and after all um Unio mystica, you know, if you uh, it, if you look at the etymology of awful, full of awe, it's typically associated with being in the divine. You know, in fact, many religions have this: being in the presence of the divine, being the presence of God, fills you with divine terror. Well, what is that? Well, it may be a combination of ecstasy and terror. So maybe that's a base level hum of the universe: ecstasy yeah. and terror. Yeah. You have, I've always admired... And the number 42. Yeah, yeah. You have this connection with this ethos you are describing. It, this is in your books, even um, um, the, the memoir of a romant romantic reductionist. Um, confessions of a reductionist. Confessions of a re uh, Reduc re reductive. Romantic, romantic reductionist. Um, and your cultural references, your reference to Richard Wagner and... Ricard Wagner and the uh, painting, paintings. You, you have this this in you, and and I'm, I have always been slightly jealous of people who have it. Um, it, yeah, it is, I have that lack. I, so I don't have it as much. I mean, when I listen to Wagner, um, I, I, it can bring me to tears. Um, but it's 
partly the tears of of the enjoyment, of the ecstasy, of the music, and partly the tear of being confronted with what I viscerally would like to have, but don't. You see what I mean? Once we had a debate and I started by saying I'm a non-romantic reductionist, and that, that was not a jab at you, that was a jab at me. See ya. <clears throat> anyway, um, but I will continue to infuse my life with Wagner, with art, um, because at least I can rub off on something I don't have, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So may maybe the basic mind of the universe is just, yeah, has a motive, like a musical motive, a light motif. That's all there is. If I mean, you would tell me if you die, you will listen to Richard Wagner for well, the rest I, of, for the whole of eternity, I would go, oh, <laughs> let it come, baby. <laughs> I'm ready for it. <laughs> now, don't you suspect, I mean, if I can ask you to speculate about the, the world soul, the anima mundi, the universal mind, mind at large, what would you think or speculate is its experiential content? What does it feel like? I know we, this is a far reach here. Yeah, um, I really don't have naturally in me the tendency to think of it romantically or spiritually. But all I can, all I know is what is available to empirical investigation. We were talking about it earlier today. There is, there was this documentary I watched years ago, it never left my mind. Pride of Lions separates an adult elephant from the herd, bring that elephant down and start eating the elephant from the back legs up. Takes six hours for the elephant to lose consciousness, to pass out. For six hours, he was being eaten alive by a pride of lions. That's nature. I can't, I can't not see this. Like Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer also could not not see this. Nature right in tooth and claw, he tooth said. Claw. Yeah, if that is But the that's expression nature, of, uh, evolved nature because of, of, um, of competition. If there's only one universe, there's no notion of competitiveness, well, right? You have evolution because you got a resource with, you got finite resources. So either I eat it or you eat it, right? I mean, that's why, that, that, that's how nature works. That surely. In physics or in, if you're just talking about one universe, we're not having an infinite number of universes that need to compete each other, right? There's only one universe. So one would suspect that whatever that universe, the content of that universe, it may be something I don't know. Do you think well, evil is just an absence of good? Or do you think there is real evil as, as a compulsion, a mental compulsion in yeah. the world? There are certainly people who want to be evil because they want to cause pain to other people for benefit of themselves. Yes. So that's part of the mind of nature too? But that's anthropomorphizing uh, nature. And that's certainly anthropomorphizing the, the world soul if such exists. Well, but in Jungian terms, if evil expresses itself as an active force, not just the absence of something, but an active force through living beings, then that's an archetypal thing. So that yeah, but that's an archetype for humans. We're not really dealing with uh, the humans. If you're looking at the entire universe, certainly its footprint, you know, most of its vast, vast, vast volume of it is completely empty, devoid of anything, leaving aside, you know, dark matter and dark energy, right? Uh, and so if the universe extends over all of that and somehow there's this universal mind at large that has this as, it, as its representation, then once it's, at least I would suspect the, the, the basic experiential content is, is, is low. Now, of course, there are, there are people like Taylor de Chandere, right? the, the, the French uh, Jesuit um, who postulated this idea of point omega that we're all evolving towards this cosmos where, you know, where the cosmos itself becomes self-conscious. Who knows? Of course, we do see us, we are becoming conscious ourselves and thereby we can reflect upon nature. And I think you've said that in one of your books, right? Maybe you can, where, where, whereby... Oh. Yeah, I don't think... Nature becomes conscious of itself. Yeah, I, I don't think metacognition of self-awareness, the ability to think about your own thoughts or to evaluate your own mental state. I don't think that's 
there primordially. I don't think that's built into the fabric of nature. I think that's something that has evolved through the four billion years of blood, sweat and tears of evolution uh, of life on this planet, maybe even longer <laughs> somewhere else. Um, so I don't think you know, the, the mind of nature in its primordial state outside living beings is capable of metacognition, self-awareness, or to pass value judgments like this is good and this is not, or to reflect and deliberate and draw plans um, and distinguish between good and evil. I, I don't think it is there. I think it is there only insofar as we seed it with it as meta, metaconscious beings, metacognitive beings, self-aware beings. We seed nature with this, Jung called it a second act of creation. Nature first simply existed. And now through us, it knows that it exists. It knows what it is. It's a second act, act of creation. Jung talks about it in his biography. And, and that happens through us, through our eyes. Um, and maybe in some point omega in a far distant cosmological future, after enough metaconscious beings have lived and died and seeded the mind of nature with metaconscious insights, maybe we will get there. Or maybe under IIT, there will be an omega complex at uh, some point. Have you read <laughs> the fantastic Chinese science fiction trilogy, um, The Three Body Problem? It's no, I, I know the three-body problem, but that's a medieval problem. In, in no, so it's the first volume, and the, the the third volume is Death End. It's a fantastic speculation. It's one of the best science fiction ever. It comes directly out of uh, China, won the Hugo and the Oscar, and, and uh, Extraordinary Imagination. So in the end, uh, they learn to generate baby universes. James Blish, same thing. Uh, the stars are yours. Um, uh, so there are at least some ideas that uh, so, some science fiction that speculate about in the distant future when mankind or whatever humanity has evolved to learns to to uh, to manipulate the basic processes that gives rise to future universes that would include self consciousness. That would be a glorious cosmological future. Maybe it would put an end to this ravage. That is the evolution of life. Ravage is a strong word. <laughs> there is a war on this continent right now. People are being shredded to pieces by the hundreds every day. Yeah, but How can I not call it a ravage? But more people, I think, are enjoying themselves on an average than they are. Yeah, maybe I'm... Yes, you're right. But maybe we should end on this high note. <laughs> no. No, <laughs> I have uh, I have some questions uh, through the uh, the conversation. Uh, I had some questions, so uh, I'm not sure I understand why it's important this argument that you had in the beginning of the podcast about uh, is it uh, important to be con the liver to be conscious and uh, when it's dead. I'm, I'm not sure if I understood why is that important, that argument that you had in the beginning. No, it's just an implication of his and also an imp uh, implication of certain readings of this uh, theory that we both favor, integrated information theory, that maybe other things besides brain are conscious, including, see, you can ask, where, supposedly this generates consciousness. Not the heart. Most people throughout most of history thought it was the heart that loves. That's why you say, I love you with all my heart. Well, actually, you don't love with the heart, you love with the hypothalamus. But in principle, the heart is an organ like the brain. It has cells, it has electrical activity, it has ionic channel, it has everything that this has. It's different, but it's also in some sense very similar. So maybe it is true that the heart is conscious. Well, so why is it, why don't I know? I, I, I don't really have access to my heart. I don't have directly conscious access to my liver. I don't feel when my liver is metabolizing the beer I had last night, right? Well, so if he tells me my liver is conscious, then he has to do some explanation why, why I don't feel my, my liver. So that's why it's not practically very, and he isn't saying that the liver has 
falls in love or yeah, worries no, I'm not about, that. <laughs> uh, you know, being depressed or something. I'm not even saying the liver corresponds to one complex, not even that. Which might be true for all I know. So it, 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 it doesn't have any practical implication. It's more some of the things like philosophers worry about or scientists worry about. If you postulate this, well, aren't you then suddenly seeing lots and lots of things are conscious that we don't really believe are conscious right now? Yeah. As, uh, as you are coming to yourself to this conclusion about uh, idealism, do you think the world is moving, the science world will move soon to this kind of thinking and to... Or you think it's, uh, it's go- we're talking about 20, 30 years from now? It's a very good question. So, uh, yes, it'll move slow. If at all, it'll move slowly. So as, as Bernardo pointed out, there's this crisis brewing at the very foundation of physics, at, at quantum mechanics. Uh, there are these very strange but now universally accepted observation that, that in fact, if you, that it's not true that there's a system and you measure it and it was in a well-defined state before, turns out that looking at things will profoundly influence what there is. So you cannot, there is no observer independent observation. That's really very weird and it's very difficult to reconcile, but it, it seems to be the case for, for, for tiny, tiny objects like electrons and, and piece and photons. Um, but and we still haven't dealt really with the consequences of that. And also the standard belief that certainly very widely held in Anglo-Saxon uh, philosophy departments so in the US, UK, Australia, m- most places different here in Europe is and in the tech industry is functionalism, com- machine functionalism, that, co- that anything, including consciousness, can be simulated once you simulate it accurately then that's all there is. There isn't anything above and beyond simulations. So of course, chat GPT will be conscious. Maybe not now, but maybe next year or in, in five years from now. And now there is a crisis brewing that, that, that this has so far not explained conscience. Yes, we have machines that might do the trick, but, but philosophers themselves are in disagreement now. And so, yes, I think. And if you look over the history, certainly in the West over the last 2,400 years, there's a waxing and waning where, where you know, some, some metaphysical um, beliefs were more popular and then less popular. Idealism used to be very popular in the 17th and 18th century in, in let's say, in, um, in Western Europe. Right now it's not. So it may, you know, by pioneers like, like uh, driven by pioneers like uh, Bernardo, in 20 years it may well become quite popular again uh, here um, uh, on the on the world stage but it, it's a it's a slow it's a secular process it's not going to happen tomorrow or next year it'll take a decade or two or three but that's okay that's a very short time especially for somebody young like you <laughs> by the time it happens you'll still be younger than i am today <laughs> <laughs> yes that's a good point <laughs> i i want to bring this conversation to a bit of more physical okay. world. So because you guys, I assume that you are humans, you have problems. Hopefully. You are not only your intellect. So what are your, what are your problems every day? Uh, well, not your that this, this is relevant for, you mean? That the discussion is relevant for? Uh, oh. Or not. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm bringing it to the physical world now. Well, right now, as I get older, I have more difficulty dealing with jet lag. At your age, probably, I don't know how much of a jet lag you have, given that you arrived, what, two days ago. But as you get older, you know, your, your, con- your, your clock uh, mechanism in your, in your body take longer to reset. So if you want to know about a problem, but, you know, it's... Given the scope of it, it's not a particular major problem. I don't really have problems. You, you don't have problems. Are there day-to-day life problems? Or? Well, just, you know, every day, but that's not... Yeah, I mean, I have to pay my taxes. I have to, you know, do all the stuff that other people do, but those are not really problems. So the biggest problem that you have is intellectual problems. Well, they obsess me. Yes, I'm. I'm. You know. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm privileged in some sense. But what obsesses me is trying to understand. And it's always obsessed me from as far as I can remember back. I want to explain before I die. I want for myself, not for others necessarily, but for myself. I want to have a cohesive explanation of everything that I that I know and that I've experienced. That's my life goal. 
always have true to. scientist through and through and you are working day and morning when you sleep when you wake up that's the, that's I think about this a lot no, not all the time because you know I, I have a day job I have to write papers and grants and you know manage people and you know all of that like you like all of us but yeah this is really what drives me yes what is helping you get closer to this goal is it writing books is it talking with people like bernardo is it like meditation is it like what is the stuff that drawn you yes. through that path yes all of the above oh, no please describe them it's uh, it's, it's things like writing books So I'm, in my next book where I talk a lot about these subjects coming out in two months called Then I Am Myself the World. And yeah, because writing a book forces you, you know, you have these vague thoughts in your head and it forces you to write them down in a logical, consistent manner with examples so that you can give it to friends and colleagues and they say, yeah, this is right or this you should cut and this you should move over here. So it makes all sense. So just writing things down really helps to crystallize and to put them together into a coherent system. And part of that process is talking to colleagues and friends like Bernardo, or like many other people, you know, they have, they have a different point of view. You are biased always right, by your own point of view. So it's important to talk to other people that tell you, well, maybe this idea isn't really original. Joe Blow has already had it 20 years ago. And then, you know, you read what Joe Blow has said about it. Um, and then having experiences, meditating, because meditation is a form of, you know, change of your experience. Psychedelics is another way how you can change your experience and all of things, all of those will together and living a life, just living a life, experiencing the things we all experience, falling in love, you know, <clears throat> having, you know, having various problems, becoming sick, all of those things and even thinking about death and and including looking forward to the point when you die because that delimits your life and that's part of your life death uh, thinking about all of those they they make up a fully lived life do you think uh, the progress towards your goal has become in 2024 and more technology all this stuff it's accelerating the progress or it's been steady through the years I guess uh, two things. So one is my encounter with psychedelics, which in my case has been recent, five years or so ago. You know, I, I had no experience. I grew up in a culture where any drugs was evil. So, you know, alcohol is fine, but any in moderation, <laughs> but any drug is evil. So that has, because you can find, you can get these very unusual states of consciousness. And also, Uh, getting older, you realize your time, your horizon is not that far away in me. You see, at your age, you say, ah, I'm not going to worry about it. It's so far away. But now, you know, I uh, have a sense of urgency. You have more sense of urgency. Correct. Because you see the time horizon. I mean, you don't know your day of death, but you, you know, you know, it's now only probably 20 years away or something. And so that sense, well, I only have a, so many more weekends left or so many more trips left. And so I better make these things count. What about you, Bernardo? About all this stuff that we discussed. The problem it is I hesitate describing the challenges I face as problems, but my personal difficulty today is managing my ability to empathize with others. I think we talked about that once uh, because, you know, Runaway empathy helps nobody, not you and nobody else. It just makes you dysfunctional. And what's happening in the world today tends to sort of suck me into that. And then that's, that's tough. That's tough. I can, it can consume my life if I don't actively try I to... You told me you can see a video and you can be crying about it for like three hours. I watched a video the other day about a boy from Gaza who was starting a YouTube channel on gaming, computer gaming, which is close to my heart. I used to be a gamer when I was a kid. And that kid died in the first day or two of, of the war. And I was compulsively re-watching that video. It's a three minutes long video. And I watched it nonstop for over an hour, as if my watching it would bring him back. I was trying to analyze afterwards, why did I do this? What was the impulse that didn't allow me to stop clicking on watch again, watch again. Something in me was like, if I keep on watching him, 
we don't lose him. Completely rational, completely nonsensical, but um, it is there. It's an impulse and I have to manage it. So I manage the news I watch. I check the headlines first before I dive in. I do not watch TV news because I have no editing control. Um, and you have to visit that room in the palace of mind called empathy, because if you if you lose your way to it, you're, you lose your humanity. But you cannot inhabit that room all the time, completely dysfunctional. That's a challenge for me. So probably in your relationships with others, it's tough for them to see, for you to see them suffer, for them to see, for you to see them Awful. stress, like a lot more than the Awful. other. Awful. Awful. I can't bear to see what's happening in Ukraine, uh, you know, over a thousand kilometers from here, let alone something happening here. The other day, one of my cats, he sneezed and a little piece of grass went up his nose from the back. So he was all the time having convulsion, convulsions, convulsions. Um, and I immediately took him to the vet and then he was anesthetized and the thing was pulled from, from his throat. But every second of my watching that cat suffer hurt. Every single second. It was eating me from inside here in the neck, in the chest. Horrible feeling. So yeah, I, I have to man. I wasn't like this. Idealism sort of sunk into me for real. It's not only here anymore. It's sunk into the body. And it was not you, uh, This is a, the cat is part of you. The kid is one with you. It's the same subject looking out from every eye. And you can believe that intellectually, like how it started for me. I never expected it would sink into my emotional in a life. It took a while. It took over 10 years. But it's bloody sunk in now. And, and I'm at a loss. I wasn't like this. I didn't evolve or learn coping mechanisms for this. I didn't have it. I was always a very intellectually oriented, practical person. You know, I would stay cool when everybody around me was despairing. And now it's contagious. Um, so that's a challenge. But I think that the, my biggest concern is not that I am suffering alone. My life's not about me. <laughs> I, I dropped that long ago. Whether Bernardo is suffering is unimportant. My biggest concern is the polarization of the world. It's happening everywhere. And, and the dehumanization of the other side. And I, I experience every day how tempting it is to look at the other camp and say, they are just idiots. They're just stupid. They, know, they, they can't think straight. Um, but I'm sure they're, they're thinking the same about that. So I, I'm concerned about this a lot. I think it's the greatest danger to the world today is this extreme polarization happening everywhere, not only politics, it's happening everywhere. And um, how, do you manage, how do you manage this? How do you get out of this? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I felt when you were describing all the stuff in your life, that there is so much intensity in your brain. Do you think? <laughs> do you think that's true? Like you are like, ah, like uh, so many tabs open all the time. Like, <laughs> do you well, feel that? There's only one life I live, as far as I know. Better at least on uh, <laughs> standard physicalism. So I better live it with passion, because the only things you know, you should only do things that are, you're really passionate about. Right, life's too short to do things that you aren't passionate about. Do you guys, uh, because a lot of young people uh, watch this, I am young, you have, with the wisdom that you gain so many, uh, so many years, like, do you have an advice to young people like living life and going about to live life? Yes, which is to be hopeful. If you look back, there are many times in human history when life looked bleak and when there was polarization. Go back in this country here, 1939 to 1945, the Nazi World War II. You go back another 30 years to World War I, where 20 million young people your age, 20 million died completely senseless, fighting over a trench that was, you know, 500 yards this way or that way, right? You look at uh, the 30 years war here on, the, on this continent, 16th century, right? when one third of all people died, one out of three died due to, you know, religious wars and black death. So there have been many periods, you know, throughout history in America, the, the period of colonization, Russia, the Holodrome, the, 
you know, a, a Mao, there have been many times in human history when some things look very bleak. And so just because right now I do agree there is this big threat of polarization in society, particularly in the West, but, you know, we, sh we should not, we'll, we'll somehow or other, the world will go on and we'll figure it out. What will happen will happen. Uh, and we really have to fight this sort of, the, and this pessimism. Yes, there's climate change, there are all sorts of challenges, but we've always had challenges and we will figure this one out. You think if we are not hopeful, we are not going to have the correct outcome? Uh, well, well because I see a lot of anxiety in young people, right? A lot of anxiety. There's global warming and then, you know, should I even have children? And then what about jobs and what about AI? Is so AI going to come for our, uh, for our... Yet objectively, by some measure, they live longer. They have, you know, they have, they have better health care. I mean, by any objective criteria, we live in an incredible wealthy world. Even if you look at the economy, people are very down on the economy. In America, we just had a, a, this spectacular growth last year. Right? But people are pessimistic because it's in the air and the mainstream media are pessimistic. And the narrative is pessimistic, but it's a narrative. And you're like, you're caught in this perception box, but you can push out the walls of this perception box and realize, no, you're not the passive agent you know, of all these, of all these forces and you're, and you're helpless. No, you can be an agent of change for the better. You, in particular you and you. <laughs> so uh, my, my question here is, so you think without being hopeful, you can achieve the same outcome? Or Correct. No? Correct. Yes. There's a reason I'm in America. I'm in America. So as you can hear, you know, I'm German. I went to America, emigrated because I liked the American attitude. I liked the American sp spirit, the can do. The past is less important than the future. Yeah, in the past, all sort of bad stuff happened. You know, very bad stuff. I agree with all of that, but I can't change it. I can't undo it. What I can do, I can only influence the present and the future. So we should be active agent of the future and change it. And you can do it. But if you don't have this belief, if you think, oh, you know, I can't do anything, everything is going to go to hell anyhow, then what's the point? Yeah, you have like certain energy in the day. If you consume it to thinking about all the past and you're not hopeful, yes, you're, you're not going to yes, consume it in the, yes, in the wrong way. Yes, be hopeful. Look at all the things, the positive things that are happening, and you can make a difference. Bernardo, do you have anything to say to the youngsters? Here, here. Nothing, nothing to add. <laughs> nothing to add. <laughs> well, if uh, I can't surpass this, um, he said the most important thing. Um, if I can add anything, um, there is no need to conform to all the recipes. Absolutely none. Um, humanity has never gotten it all right, never throughout its history. The chance that we got it right now, his generation, my generation, the chance that we are getting it right, very close to zero. So there is no need to conform Girl, speak to... for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Except like this defeatist it, attitude. All right, we got some things right. Uh, we, we, we can cash that in and, and be happy. But there is no need to, to conform to old modes, to old thinking. Um, try, try something else. Look at, what, look at where we have brought us. Um, we can do better. You can do better. You can do better. And reflecting back to our conversation, what are your thoughts about this conversation? Fantastic. Yeah, it was very engaging. It was fun, enjoyable. Christopher, you might be the worst best podcaster about the philosophy of mind, <laughs> mind and body problem. I never met a person having so beautiful targeted questions exactly on the mistake, not on the holes of the ideas. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, with that being said, I want to say that uh, as, uh, as an observer here, it's so beautiful to see so much passion that you guys have about this topic. It was amazing to observe. It was the best moments of my life to watch you fight oh, about, thank this, you. <laughs> about this topic. <laughs> and thank you for the hospitality here. And thank you guys for watching until the end of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>